You're listening to the Deep Purple Podcast, a fan podcast about one of the most legendary bands of all time, Deep Purple. We take a look at the music, history, and people behind the band Deep Purple and beyond. Welcome to this bonus episode of the Deep Purple Podcast. In today's episode, we are presenting in its entirety our conversation with Claude Schnell uh, that we recorded for the Dio Tribute Special. And if you heard, uh, you know, 10, 20 minutes or so of that as a snippet on the Dio Tribute Special, uh, you're probably tuning in from that. And here you're going to hear the full extent of our interview, starting off with Claude's beginnings, his meeting with Glenn Hughes and working with, with Glenn, and then into his time, of course, with Dio and all the, the great stories from those uh, times. So here you go. Here's our interview with Claude Schnell. All right. We're on the line with Claude Schnell. Uh, Claude, why don't you tell uh, our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background? Um, well, there's really not too much to tell. Um, I'm a musician. I'm a keyboard player. Uh, there are some people who know who I am. Um, most of those people are fans of a band called Dio, in which I was for about um, a decade or so as the keyboard player. And before that, I played with um, a guy probably very familiar to your listeners, a bass player named uh, Glenn Hughes. Uh, he played in a little band called Deep Purple. Um, and prior to that, I played in a variety of different bands. I've been playing piano since I was a little kid, like all poor kids who had to play piano when they were kids. And um, yeah, and the rest of it's kind of an open book, which I'm sure anybody who's interested in can find more than I'd care for them to know about just online. <laughs> so there you go. That's great. So what were your like earliest memories then of learning to play as a child? Uh, all horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, one day, uh, well, uh, it's, it's probably worth mentioning that for, for people who aren't familiar with, with my really boring story, um, <clears throat> is that I, I was born in Brooklyn, but I was raised in Paris, um, until the age of six when my parents decided that I should have an American education. <laughs> so, um, around the time I think I was probably five, um, a piano turned up in, in our home in Paris and, um, you know, there were. There was myself and a couple of cousins, and it was just, you know, something to annoy the adults with. But uh, when we moved to New York, uh, suddenly a piano teacher turned up. And that was pretty much the end of my childhood until I left New York when I was uh, 17. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so th those are my early memories. A teacher showed up, and I started having to do, you know, all the things that uh, kids have to do when they're learning piano instead of being outside playing with my friends. Um, but you know, I was pretty diligent about it. Um, fortunately at some point during the, the learning process, um, there, there was this guy who was just a phenomenal, phenomenal keyboard player. He played in my, my best friend's band. And, um, um, I was always, well, jealous wasn't the right word, just kind of pissed off that, you know, that, well, how come he can, you know, pick up songs so quickly and play so well and this and that and the other. And, um, Probably for the first time, I actually had a, a genuine bonding moment with, with, with my mom, at least a genuine social bonding moment. She said to me, well, instead of complaining, why don't you find out who his teacher is? I was like, oh, and you know what? That doesn't sound like a bad idea. <laughs> so I did. And then for the three years that I studied with that guy, a, a guy by the name of Teddy Harris, um, all the vistas just opened up, all the blocks just fell away, and suddenly I understood um, that the piano wasn't just something to ruin my childhood. It was actually an incredibly um, conductive vehicle that can inspire, that can create, that can do all the, all the magical things that, that music in general can do. So you started with a, a, cl a classical background? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, there, there was the, the never-ending series of, 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 uh, um, of classical pieces as well as the... <clears throat> the, the uh, the exercises associated with classical training, um, those of your listeners who, who had to go through this will recognize the names Hannon and Cherney, which are two um, uh, common books. Uh, Cherney was a school of velocity for, for um, being able to play quickly, and Hannon is just this basically the you know the the, the acid workout for um, every, every manipulation of uh, finger positions that you could possibly imagine. So, it's roughly, I don't know, maybe like an 80 page book that you're supposed to be able to play through in an hour. Okay. So what, so what, what, um, what was it that really 
made you get interested in rock music or your early rock influences? So, so there was, um, there, there, there was this guy in, 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 uh, my, in my, I guess it was back in junior high school, um, who uh, was a real, a real character. I mean, he was, you know, he, he was wearing platform shoes and just like a real freaky looking kid, but, but there, there was something extraordinarily charismatic about him. And um, I found out he was a drummer and I had heard him play and he was, he was unbelievable. And it turned out that his, um, his drum teacher was a guy named um, Mark Bell, which most people would know that name better is his, uh, uh, his stage name, uh, Joey Ramone. Oh. Of the, of the Ramones, yeah. So, so uh, this, this, this kid who eventually became um, my lifelong best friend, was a guy named Joey Belfiore, um, we, we got together just, just to hang out. And um, well, he, he, he had learned that I, that I played, and much to my amazement, he, he was he, he was impressed, not only impressed uh, with with my you know my my standard classical performance stuff, but just almost mesmerized. And I mean, something that I wouldn't have expect, expected from a guy who you know who was just like a freaky kind of avant garde musician dude. And um, he turned me on to, I believe it was the Machine Head record followed by the In Rock record. And I didn't even recognize the sound of John Lord's Hammond because it just didn't sound like any of the organ music I had heard prior to. Um, although I suppose I had probably heard some of it on the radio or whatever, but that that was probably the, the, the um, epiphany. Hearing John Lord playing that beautifully distorted Hammond and, and realizing how significantly it contributed to the music of, of an otherwise um, what's the word I'm looking for an otherwise standard issue rock band you know guitar bass drums and whatever and the singer but with, with John Lord's presence in Deep Purple for my money as well as probably lots of other people's it, w- it was the addition of that of, of his um, uh, iconic Hammond sound that, that set Purple apart from all the other guitar rock bands of the day at least the ones that I, you know, I was familiar with. So when I heard that, um, a little light went off, and and I was like, yeah, okay. So now, now I, this is what I want to do. Um, and there you go. So, so that that was that was probably the the, the the defining moment, anyway, in my decision to to at least attempt to pursue um, uh, being a, you know, being. I don't even I don't, I don't even think I thought in terms of being a professional musician, but at least a musician who played in bands that you know locally and uh you know got to meet girls of course that was obviously the big motivation um and like that little did i know you know that uh, a decade later huh, things would take quite surprising turns not not only to be playing with uh um with with glenn who had been in deep purple but uh obviously the outgrowth of purple into rainbow and rainbow means ronnie and then to wind up playing with ronnie the the, the sequence of events was was no, nothing I ever could have imagined in my wildest dreams. Um, so, uh, Claude, who do you feel that you've uh, learned the most from uh, in your career? And um, how do you feel that um, they they pushed you to be like a better musician and performer? Uh, well, um, well, in, in, in my career, as well as in life in general, I always try to learn something from everybody I encounter because there's always... The, there's the, I... I I feel that there's always something to be garnered from, you know, someone you've you've not known before, someone who brings something their their own unique signature, or even if it's just personality to you know, to the table. There's, there's there are things to be learned always, and and I well, actually, I, I was kind of raised to always pay attention to those kinds of things to learn from, you know, any and every situation. I uh, remember in classes that I was was bored in um, and had grades that were suffering as a result. Um, my, my mother pointed out to me that, well, if, if, even if you're bored by, by what she's saying, the, she being the teacher, um, you know, there, there, there might be some things that, that interest you. So, you know, you might, you might want to you know, ask some questions and so forth and so on, which I, I, took, I took her at her word. And, you know, then, then my critique wasn't that my grades weren't quite as good as they should be. It was just that I asked too many questions, <laughs> which, you know, re- reinforced my notion that as a kid, you just can't win. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so uh, musically, um, I mean, honestly, I, 
truly the the, the most significant. Well, it, it, it's really it's really hard to, to quantify who who was the most influential, um, who taught me the most. Uh, I mean, learning is an incremental process, and I don't think there are any real leaps and bounds. And if they are, they're not so much a function of learning as much as they are a function of inspiration and perhaps circumstance. Um, I learned I learned an awful lot from day one from from this kid Joey back in Brooklyn, um, who who taught me to listen to music in a way that I had never thought of listening before. Um, but, you know, when I listened to classical music, I, I was trained to to separate the the various components of the orchestra and the strings and the and the horns and the brass and so forth and so on. Um, but when I listened to uh, pop or, or rock records, it was just that yeah, was a song was yeah, it was cool. You got your foot, and that's the end of it. But um, with, with Joey pointed out to me the, the the interplay, especially in Deep Purple, the interplay between you know Richie and, and John, and and to me that that just it, it really spoke to me that there was. Um, Almost a conversation that you could monitor when they would be exchanging, you know, their 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 four, uh, eight bar trades offs in, in the in the various songs. Um, you know, playing a band with him a few years later uh, was was a real wake up call because I was now being exposed to not 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 just playing. You know, when you, when you play piano by yourself, you're you just you're a solo artist, if you will. You know, it's just you and the instrument. But the, the, these were my first experiences playing in a band, so there was a lot to learn. And I was very fortunate that that the guys we were playing with, um, well, jo Joey is one. Uh, the other guys in the band were all equally talented. Um, I remember our bass player used to take lessons from Stanley Clark back in the day. Oh, wow. Um, which may be a name that doesn't ring a bell for you guys. Oh, no, it does for me. I, I, I... Oh, yeah. I'm a oh, good. Base, good, I'm, good. I was gonna just about to say no, nothing makes me happier than dating myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we were like you know 15 years old, and, and our bass player was 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 uh, 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 using his learner's permit to draw. Maybe we were 16 by then because he was driving up to Harlem to go take lessons from you know from this incredible, just mind blowing musician. And then it was Stanley Clark. So you can imagine how, how proficient of a bass player you know, the bass player was. Joey, I already spoke of. Um, the guitar player went on to be actually really good friends with Richie Blackmore, as it turns out. Um, he played, um, uh, ironically, his, his biggest claim to fame was he played in a, in a reggae band called Shinehead, which I've been led to understand is hmm. quite a big, uh, big deal in, in the reggae circles. Um, but anyway, he was, he was our guitar player when we were kids, and, and it was just a... a a, a very fertile learning experience in terms of being around guys who took what they were doing seriously. You know, I, I thought that playing in a band would just be, you know, a diversion from, you know, the, the misery of schoolwork and practicing piano and, and all the rest of it. But it turned out that it was actually quite a bit of work as well. Um, and it, in it, that in it, in and of itself was, um, was quite an education. Uh, Interestingly, that the same work ethic that I learned playing with these kids when you know when we were children was not terribly different than the the work ethic that I discovered when I played in bands with both Glenn and Ronnie. So I, I kind of had a um, a good turn of fortune that the first guys I played with not only were really good musicians, but they took what they were doing very seriously, and uh, that imparted. A, I mean. It, 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 wasn't something new for me to take music seriously because, you know, by that time I'd been playing uh, six, seven, eight years um, of, of every day sitting at the piano and practicing for hours on end. But but now to do it for something that was fun was was a was a brand new um, juxtaposition of those two things. I never associated playing my my classical stuff and practicing my piano as being fun, but the work that I was doing in the band was arguably just, just as difficult. Well, maybe not quite, but it, it was difficult enough. But it was absolutely the best times of my childhood. Oh, that's great. So, and, and of course, you know, moving forward, you know, the, the, the things that I learned from, from Glenn and from Ronnie are, are just incalcul incalculable, um, both in their own way. You know, Glenn was... And, and it continues to be just, just such a brilliant, brilliant musician. Um, he's, he's one of these guys where you can't be near him 
and not feel the the aura of talent just just filling the room with his presence um in a, in a very different way from Ronnie as it happens i mean obviously Ronnie is just you know an incredibly intelligent and talented brilliant 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 musician um but Ronnie has has a great many other um uh, skills and talents under his belt. He's very much a well-rounded, uh, well-read, well-educated guy. And with with Glenn, not to take anything away from him personally, but he's all about his his art. And and that 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 was a very infectious presence um to be basically under the tutelage of because he was like the first, you know, big name guy I was playing with. And and we hung out, we we got to be best friends. We were hanging out probably, I don't know, eight, 10 hours every single day, even when we weren't doing music, just running around, hanging out and stuff. Um, and it was with him, like I said, it was, you know, he, he never saw a piano that he didn't want to sit at and just start noodling. And um, I remember one one wee hour of, uh, of the morning, uh, many, 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 many years ago, Glenn turned up at, at, at my door and uh, he, he wasn't in a... Um, uh, most sober of conditions. So this is, of course, before he's, you know, I think he's 25 years clean and sober now. But at that time, he turned up and um, just desperately wanted to sit at my grand piano. And it's like 7 o'clock in the morning <laughs> after he had been out all night. And I was like, really, dude? All right, sure. And he, and he comes in and he kind of, you know, makes his way to the piano. And I have a very vivid memory of this. that he would. It looked to me like he was just, throwing his fingers on the keys of the piano. He wasn't he wasn't playing any chords that I could readily <laughs> discern. I could barely tell which notes he was hitting. Some of them looked like, you know, like I said, like he was just throwing his hands on, on a keyboard like, like if you if you were trying to teach a baby to sit at the piano for the first time. And he would make these sounds with the piano and then put his unbelievable mellifluous voice on top of that. And it would just sound like, you know, the number one hit every single time. So, it, it was really, really crazy to, to, to be around that kind of um, inspirational talent in spite of the questionable condition that, that he may have been in physically at, at those moments. So, um, so I learned a lot from that as well, just that, that it, it, isn't in a, it, it isn't necessarily about the precision or the, or the forethought or the, or the um, uh, preparation for what you're going to play. If, if you're talented enough, as clearly Glenn is, you're, you're capable of just cre creating in the moment something of magnificent beauty. And, and Glenn did that. I mean, <laughs> every, every single time he, he I, I've never heard him not create something that was just astonishingly magnificent. How did you end up meeting Glenn and working with him? Ah, that was, that was kind of a cool story. So, um, uh, I, I don't expect that your listeners will know this, but um, when, I, when I moved out to L.A., I was doing a bunch of session work because by that time I had a reasonable amount of experience from having done it back east. And um, a, a lot of the bands that, that, that I was um, stumbling across didn't really attract my attention to the point where I, I, I wanted to, 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 to do anything to be involved with them. Um, but... Eventually, I, I ended up with a bunch of guys who, who, who played really well, and there, were, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was some sense of promise in, in what was going on, and, and that was a band that was called Rough Cut. And most notably, the guitar player in that band was um, Jake Williams, also known as Jakey e. Lee, who went on to replace Randy Rhodes in Ozzy's band. And um, so we, we'd been playing together for a while, and the band was doing pretty well. Um, Wendy Dio, Ronnie's wife at the time, um, had had the notion of starting a management company, and as it turned out, we were you know, we did a showcase, and and um, Wendy came down, and she was our manager. Um, after I don't know, maybe a year, a couple of years of, of playing out and, and getting a fair amount of notice, um, Jake got the option to go play with um, Ozzy, which, as his friend, I was like. Dude, he got to go do it. And, and he, he had reservations, as, as one might expect, because, you know, we had, we had invested this time in a band and so forth and so on. But, you know, as, as, as his friend, I wanted him to do what was best for him, figuring that, you know, there's no shortage of great guitar, but at least at the time, uh, I should 
put that caveat in there. At the time, there were no shortage of, of really wonderful guitar players um, in, in L.A. So um, not that I think he left the band based on my, you know, advice, but history dictates or history shows that he did, in fact, leave. And uh, we went about finding replacements. And um, there, there were some there were some hiccups in the search because by this time it was no longer just a question of, <clears throat> of whom the, the band wanted to, uh, uh, to replace him uh, because when he was our manager, she had her, her share of input. But I'm, again, I'm digressing. Uh, the, the point is, is that I, I wasn't thrilled with the direction that the band was taking. Um, it, it wasn't following of the course that um, Joe, the bass player and myself kind of envisioned for us when, when we had started out. And um, at this time, I was hanging out at a club called The Troubadour um, in L.A., kind of a world-famous historical place. And I had gotten to be pretty good friends with um, with the manager of the bar. And one, one, this one particular day, I went there after rehearsal, and he's like, oh, you're, you're in luck. I'm like, well, why? Well, Glenn's here. I'm like, Glenn who? Was Glenn Hughes. I'm like, oh, from Berkeley. Yeah, that's cool. He goes, dude, don't you know who I'm like, Yeah, I know who Glenn is. And, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, um, you know, the bar closes, and we're hanging out like the after hours kind of thing. And the trooper, of course, has this well, not of course, but the, the trooper has a piano on its stage, and uh, the, the the manager, a guy named Ron, uh, he should go up there and play. I'm like, I'm just gonna go play in front of an empty club. He goes, trust me, go sit at the piano, and just just noodle like you always do. So I did, and along comes Glenn. He goes, I'll oh, play play that again, mate. <laughs> well, what? Whatever you just did, and then he starts just scatting on top of what I'm playing. He sits down next to me, and we start just like improvising together. He's like, yeah, you know, uh, we we should play together. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, that that that's basically how that happened. Um, wow. I, I mean, I, I I I didn't really take him seriously because I knew of his reputation to be very spur of the moment, and and you know, not the most reliable. Reliable is not the right word. Um, uh, he, he was extremely enthusiastic, and not, not to take the things. I'm, I'm sure we all know people like that who you know, say things right off the top of their heads that, in reality, never plays out in real life. Sure. Um, so I, I kind of, I kind of expected that. But he gave me his number, and um, you know, I called him the next day, and he said, "No, yeah, we should get together." And we did. And we, uh, he was, well, you know, we, we met at the Troubadour kind of regularly for. I don't know, it seems like probably a few weeks at least, if not a couple months. And he would always sit at the piano and just kind of mess around. And, um, I, you know, I knew at that time that he was uh, just just coming off the first Youth Thrall record. And he said, ah, you know, I think I think you should come down and, and, and meet Pat, Pat Thrall, the guitar player. Um, so I did, and uh, that was basically it, and I was in the band. So – um, going back to what you were saying before about uh, being in Rough Cut, you said that uh, Wendy Dio um, was your manager in that yes, band. She was Miss Manager, as we called her. <laughs> so was that uh, was that your introduction to um, to getting to meet Ronnie and and wind up uh, uh, playing with him, or um, how did that uh, uh, play out? Um, well, a lot of these things kind of happened um, uh, in concert, so. Um, I think the first time, oh yeah, no, no. The first time I met Ronnie, absolutely, no, you're right. The first time I met Ronnie was um, when when the band was doing um, uh, our showcase uh, for Wendy um, in, his, in, his, in an attempt um, to garner her interest for management. Mm -hmm. And we had rented a big soundstage at SIR, which is a big, um, uh, a big rehearsal and performance facility in LA. And, um, you know, we, we set up our gear and we were just running through some stuff just to warm up. And in the midst of it, um, in walked Wendy, who we had, mo had known, we had met her before. And um, behind her, this, um, uh, this stunning woman with long, long jet black hair, who I didn't really recognize at the time. And um, behind her, her husband, who I did recognize, who was Mark Stein, the keyboard player and the singer from the Vanilla Fudge, wow. which I'm guessing is probably out of your wheelhouse of recognition. We mostly know it because we know Richie was obsessed with Vanilla Fudge when they formed Deep Purple. But I'm not too familiar really? with Vanilla Fudge. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, he was very he was very much into Vanilla Fudge and wanting the band to sound like Vanilla Fudge, and he was always talking about them. And I know Carmen Apice as well, but other than that, not super. 
Wow. Well, that, that that's interesting because I mean, because when you consider uh, Timmy Bogart, who was just an insanely great bass player, there, there I, I can easily see a lot of parallels between his playing and, and Roger Glover's playing. Yeah, I think when so that, when when they first mm-hmm. came to America, I think they were being billed by like the American press as the British Vanilla Fudge when Deep Purple first. <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow. Well, that that's quite a feather in Carmine's cap, isn't it? <laughs> being, yeah, <laughs> not bad. Um, wow, wow. Yeah, needless to say, yeah, all the guys in, in that purple lineup are just, you know, in, in my mind, the, the pinnacle of, of, of achievement in, in each of those um, arenas of their of their respective instruments. Um, but I, I, just, I just love Ian Pace's drumming. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah, crazy, he's crazy, crazy, fantastic. Crazy um, I mean, honestly, back back in the day, there was. Um, and here we go on one of these tangents I was referring to. We love tangents. Um, you might want to pull up a chair. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you, you know how in, in like like the automotive world, there's, you're either a Chevy guy or a Ford guy. Right. Which, you know, and they're both the same freaking truck. I don't, I don't get what the big deal is. But okay. In, 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 in the um, early 70s, you were either a Zeppelin guy or a Purple guy. Mm-hmm. It was the same, there was the same kind of, of split, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you couldn't like both bands. But I never understood the whole notion <laughs> of competition in, in, in the arts and in, in music in particularly because nobody's keeping score, but whatever, be that as it might. I mean, I loved Zeppelin. I think the first real, real big concert I ever went to was uh, um, uh, when Zeppelin played the Madison Square Garden in, I want to say, 69, maybe. Um, I know I was way too young to be there, but but my <laughs> friend and I hopped a subway and we just went to Manhattan and went. Um, but that was you know, that was kind of a life altering thing um, as well. But um, uh, wow. if you, if you have to choose teams, brother, you know, Purple versus Zeppelin, for me because of the presence of keyboards in Purple, well, that was kind of a done deal. Yes, you're going to say that uh, John Paul Jones played uh, Mellotron and, and and organ on some of the Zeppelin stuff, but. Yeah, that didn't count. I mean, it counted, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, no, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, here's here's where that digression kind of falls apart because now I don't remember the point I was trying to make. Um, <laughs> but but um, I, I mean, from 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 the get go, um, I was just just a huge Deep Purple fan, and um, you know, the, the more I I, I I made a study of that band, I, I, okay. So just to go back to the, the, the first band I played with, you know, I knew they played a lot of Purple stuff. So I listened to the record and I, I learned John Solo's, his, you know, as best I could. Mm-hmm. And um, we, we, you know, I, I get there and I'm all excited. We start playing and like uh, 20 bars into the song, the guitar player is like waving his hand. He's looking at me like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm, I'm playing the tune. He goes, that, that's not how it goes. I'm like, yeah, it kind of is. He goes, no, no, listen. And he pointed out to me that, you know, John Lord was playing a very specific part. It wasn't just about staying in the key that the song was in whatever the song might have been. Um, I'm like, oh. And I hear I'm all focused on just playing the solo properly. Mm-hmm. And I never even got that far because it was like, all right, well, you know, we'll get together again when once, once this guy learns how the song goes. Oh, great. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it, 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 it was, you know, for my, for my first foray into trying to play in a band, um, especially when I had gotten such such high um, praise from from Joey for having heard me play classical, you know, it was kind of a you know go hide in the corner sort of <laughs> moment. Um, but but one, again, that going back to your question about what did I learn? That, that's when I really had to make a study of how the different elements that um, uh, go into a performance of a band play together, and and that, that was something that never even occurred to me. Um, because in, when you're when you're playing piano by yourself, it's just you. There's there's no need to pay attention to really, you know, the, the, the rest of the band. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, in addition to how great each of the musicians in Purple, in basically in, in any incarnation, always were, the way that they were integrated just created something that was greater than the sum of the parts. So I think I think being a Purple yeah. fan in and of itself taught me an awful lot because then when I, when I went back to start learning the, um, uh, you know, the, the entirety of the, of the, of the set list that we'd be playing, um, I, I didn't just learn, you know, the melody of whatever solo John Lord happened to play, but I, I, I actually kind of studied it because I, I'd gotten in the, in the, which was, isn't hard for me, the obsessive mindset of like really 
splitting the hairs of the details. And and once I started listening critically like that to the solos John would play, they start. I mean, they were never easy, but they started to feel almost natural. Mm-hmm. And it, it didn't occur to me at the time, but years later, it, it was obvious that John was a classically trained guy as well. So the hand positions that I managed to find in in, in copying him were clearly the same. And um, I mean, I, I, I felt pretty proud of, of how well I was able to emulate the things that he did. So, so um, going back to um, uh, what we were talking about before, yeah. when you first met Ronnie yeah. and um, oh uh, yes, right. So thank uh, you. You know, got into right. his so, yeah. So, so so Mark Stein walks in, which you know, for me as a keyboard player, and, and I I knew who he was just because. <clears throat> the fudge roar of an uh, fudge roar of vanilla band, the fudge roar <laughs> of Brooklyn band um, that that I had kind of grown up just a few, not not that I knew them personally, of course, but they were you know just a few blocks away. Vinny and I joke to this day that you know we we got to be best friends and we we grew up you know twenty blocks from each other and never even knew that the other guy existed, which was <laughs> you know kind of strange. But um, yeah, so so Mark walks in and, and I was kind of like oh just a wee bit nervous. And then in walks Ronnie. And that, yeah, that was just like, uh oh, this is for real. Because, I mean, we, we didn't know it was going to be anybody but Wendy. Um, uh, Mark Stein's wife, Patty, was there because she and Wendy were, um, again, I'm speaking, you know, stuff. Patty was um, Wendy's partner in what was going to become Niji Management. Although I, I do think that that was kind of short lived as well. Uh, but in any event, the fact that, that Mark Stein was there and then Ronnie. Just, just really, really raised the like gut wrenching, nerve wracking factor because mm-hmm. um, it, it it was really just Johnny on the spot. Here you are, you know this this is this is what it really is going to count. And and to Ronnie's credit, um, and maybe to the band's credit as well, as soon as we finished whatever whatever song, we were just basically practicing for when we were going to get to play it for real. Ronnie just came right up to the stage and, and he walked up to me and he put out his hand. He goes, um, "Hi, I'm Ronnie." I'm, <laughs> no, kidding, dude. I don't know who you are. Uh, and he goes, yeah. So, so when he tells me you went to UB, which which the University of Buffalo, where where he had gone, I guess a, you know a decade or so before me, um, and uh, it was it was like, yeah. But he goes, oh, well, show me your keyboards, you know. Like, yeah, you guys sound great, man. Um, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing where this is going to go. And I mean, he was within I don't know thirty seconds. I felt like I had known him my whole life. He was just completely unassuming, um, absolutely genuine and authentic. Not not a not a, not a threat, not a hint of, of ego or or uh, presumption about him. He was just you know uh, just 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 another guy, just another musician who who was meeting other musicians. He he was spectacularly cool. I mean, again, so Glenn when I met Glenn, Glenn was. Uh, equally congenial and, and and friendly and and open, but but there was always the the sense of you know the the, the crown was weighing on his head kind of thing, and Ronnie not at all, just just as as down to earth and as as salt of the earth guy as you could imagine. As for Glenn, it's probably worth mentioning that he went from you know from zero to hundred in, in no time flat, and by that I mean he was just I think he was seventeen when he got into purple. Is that right? Or I think in, in trapeze, I think he was about sixteen or something. We know we saw a video of him. At, Wasn't he like twenty yeah, or twenty-one? And very, yeah, very young. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, he he went, he went, yeah, exactly. And to be that age in a band that big, if you really think that's not going to fuck with your head, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not not to mention that he's so spectacularly talented anyway. I can imagine, and and you know, I mean, he, he you know, he he. he learned how to play i guess at some point but he never really studied he's not you know he's not like a i i, I don't know like a um you know a, a jaco pistorius who went to went to berkeley or, or anything mm-hmm. he's, he's just you know was more or less a self-taught guy mm-hmm. um actually same with 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 all of them guys that that generation of players mm-hmm. you know i mean they all learned the basics but then the the magnificence that they eventually grew into was largely uh, self-taught, and self-taught. I mean, it was taught through inspiration. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, yeah. the, the first really great player in, in in any discipline wasn't taught how to be that great player. They were just inspired enough to get to that point by themselves. 
Hmm. And then, you know, history shows us that everybody tries to copy that, that, that one guy's moment <laughs> of inspiration. Yeah. Right? Well put. Yeah, definitely well put. So, yeah, so that was the beginning of, 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 uh, of, of, of well, actually, that was, that was the initial meet with Ronnie. And um, mm-hmm. it wasn't long before Wendy had coerced him into uh, reluctantly volunteering to produce the Rough Cut demo, uh, which he did. And um, he produced it with with his um, uh, his friend. And um, I guess at that time, the guy was the um, the live sound mixer for Sabbath. Um, and that guy was uh, Vinny Apice's best friend, a guy by the name of Angelo Arcuri. Oh, okay. Um, Angelo went on to become <laughs> not only Dio's live engineer, but he recorded all the studio records as well. So, oh, so okay. as Angelo points out, the first time that Ronnie and Angelo ever worked together in a studio recording was when they recorded the, I think there were like, I don't know, maybe five or six rough cut tunes that we did for our demo back then. Mm-hmm. There are actually two of them that you could find on, on um, YouTube if, if anybody's curious, um, mostly because of the virtue of the fact that, that Jake was the guitar player in the band. So I think if you search mm-hmm. early Jake, <laughs> the guitar solo, you can find uh, two tracks um, from, from his, well, from our rough cut days, and they're called uh, Used and Abused and A Little Kindness. And... Um, uh, the, the guitar solos on, on both of those tracks are just, for my money, is pretty much as good as anything Jake's, Jake's ever done since, especially A Little Kindness. Uh, I've heard A Little Kindness. It's really excellent. No, thank you. I, I, I that really one. like it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's awesome. No, that's nice to hear. Wow. Nobody said that about that song in probably, I don't know, <laughs> 30 years. <laughs> but cool. Well, that, that's yeah. very nice to hear. I wish you could see the smile on my face. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So, um, so now you're, you, um, you've met Dio and, um, now your first album with that you recorded with him was last in line. You weren't on Holy Diver. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. But I did, I did, um, play on, um, Evil Eyes, which mm-hmm. was recorded before we actually went off to do last in line. I, I don't okay. remember what the circumstance was, but we needed a song for, um, either a B-side in Europe, or I, I don't remember what exactly the the, the, the deal was, but no, I, did, I certainly didn't play on the on the, um, the Holy Diver record. Um, but interestingly, uh, th- there had been discussion about that happening because, so once we were all in the studio together, I mean, the, the friendship with Ronnie and myself really blossomed, not only because he was, you know, producing the band and all of that, but he turned out he's a dog lover guy. So we had the whole dog thing in common and there's a New York thing. And we, we, we just hit it off for whatever reason. And, um, you know, there, there was kind of hints that when, when they finally got around to, to doing the record, um, you know, if there were going to be keyboards to be done, and they, you know, he didn't really think of anybody else that, that he would want to use. And when he was kind of, well, I don't know if she was pushing for it, but she was she was certainly keeping me um, on the hook, if you will. That um, you know, don't forget, they're they're going to be doing keyboards one day, so you know, wait, fine, whatever. <laughs> and um, it, it never really came to, to to materialize. There was a couple of times it was supposed to happen. I went down to the studio and I hung out, and no, well, not today. Meanwhile, I saw all these rented keyboards that were sitting, you know, in the control room. I'm like. That's kind of weird. So as it, as it turned out, um, yeah, Jimmy Bain had been lobbying to be the keyboard player, bass player in, in Dio, much like Geddy Lee from um, from Rush. Oh. And um, uh, because Ronnie and, and Jimmy had such a long history together from having played in Rainbow, uh, Ronnie was happy to ind- indulge that. Um, and it, it clearly it worked for the record for whatever limited keyboards they did on the Holy Diver record. Uh, they were able between the two of them, between Jimmy and Ronnie, to to do whatever needs to be done. Um, but of course, then came time to do a tour, and there wasn't enough deal material to fill up the requisite slot um, uh, for, for for a live show. So they had to supplement the Dio tracks with um, uh, Sabbath and Rainbow tracks, and there was just no way that Jimmy was going to be able to, you know, to pull all of that off. So Ronnie reached out to me and uh, and offered me the gig. And interestingly, when uh, around the same time that um, 
that this was all happening, Glenn was making noises about wanting me to audition for Youth Thrall, which, I mean, I, I was thrilled to, to, to beyond words at the opportunity of playing in a band with these, you know, clearly world-class musicians. Um, uh, the drummer in that band was a guy named Mark Rennie who had played with John Ponte and Jethro Tull and uh, uh, Gino Vanelli, just just monster, monster drummer. Um, and, and there's something something about playing in a four-piece band versus a five-piece band that it just feels it feels more I don't know well more compact, but that that's not the the characterization I'm looking to make. It's it's, it's just I don't know it, it's it's somewhat different. And um, uh, I, I was a little concerned that if if I were to leave Rough Cut to go play with Glenn and and then you know the powers that be were, were were pissed off at me, well that would but you know I, I didn't want I didn't want to shoot myself in the foot and not get a chance to play on the Dio record because I had made a bad choice about putting my priorities um, ahead of Rough Cut and, and, and choosing to play with Glenn instead. So as, as it happened, um, I, I, I said, well, Wendy's my manager. She's taken, you know, 15% of my money. I'll ask her. <laughs> and she was like, you definitely go audition. Don't tell the lads because if you don't get it, why, you know, why? Why make an issue of it? And if you do get it, who cares? <laughs> Which was like, <laughs> oh, all right, sure. And um, uh, and of course I did get it. And then the, the Holy Dabber record never happened for me. So I, I couldn't help but think that maybe that, you know, was complicit in the whole um, in the whole decision-making process. But Ronnie assured me years later that had nothing to do with it. He, 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 for his money, getting, getting away from Rough Cut and getting to play with guys like Glenn was the best thing I ever could have done for myself. So, so there you go. Cool. Cool. But interestingly, um, I was playing. Sorry, here we go again. Um, <laughs> I, I was I, I was playing with Glenn, um, and by the, all right, so I, I I played with Glenn. It kind of ran its it, it, its uh, its course, and uh, Pat had become um, uh, disillusioned with with how the band was going, and decided he wanted to do something else. Um, so so Glenn and I carried on with with kind of a, a Glenn solo project, which, which in its own way, I mean, it was musically great as, as like, as I said before, everything that Glenn does seems to be, but, but it, it really was meandering. It, 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 it was getting very frustrating to deal with, um, uh, the frustrations that seem to present themselves every day in, in, in forms that I'm not going to get into right now. And, um, one, one, Early, early morning when I had to walk home from, you know, the, the record plant, which was I don't know, maybe three miles from from where I probably was in in Hollywood. Um, yeah, just as the sun's coming up, because Glenn, who was my ride, um, but never mind. I had to walk home, and just about <laughs> the time I got home, um, the phone rings, and uh, and, I, and I was calling it, you know, like maybe it was like eight thirty or nine o'clock by this point, and uh, oh, hi, Claude, it's Ronnie. I, I, he'd always answer the phone like that, as if you didn't know who he was <laughs> when you would hear his voice, right? Um, so I'm like, yeah, right, well, we'll say something wrong, because again, 9 o'clock in the morning, that's not usually when musicians call each other. <laughs> and he goes, right, well, listen, we're, we're, we're putting, we're putting the, the DOD tour together now, and, and I'd like you to come out with us and play keywords. But I, I know you're playing with Glenn, so I just wanted to see if that, you know, was something that, that you would consider doing. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think my mouth waited for my brain to think yes before I said yes. It was just like, uh, so, so, you know, here I am uh, uh, picturing myself, you know, shuffling through the, through the streets of Hollywood in the early, you know, kind of like the walk of shame kind of thing, you know, make my way back to the apartment after, you know, an another dismal night in the studio where I'm questioning the validity of, uh, validity of my life choices and uh, just, just crying in my milk about, well, if this one thing falls apart, you know, what am I going to do next? You know, maybe it's time to, you know, see about getting a, a real job finally and this and that. And um, I, I get into the apartment and uh, the phone rings and everything turned around because Ronnie offered me that gig. Huh? Wow. So we, we started rehearsal soon after that. And um, yeah, then the rest, as they say, is history. What kind of input did you have in the writing process with with Dio or the writing song arrangement that sort of stuff? Well, um, for, for the for, for the first record uh, in which I participated, which was Last in Line, um, I, I wasn't 
the songwriting was basically done the same way it had been done for Holy Diver, which meant that um, Viv and Jimmy and Ronnie and Vinny would 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 hash out a, a few ideas for tunes. And I mean, I, I was there, but you know, the, what they were working on was basically um, based on the riffs that that either Viv or Ronnie would come up with. Um, uh, Jimmy, in some cases, had his his own contributions as well, but th- there was nothing done on keyboards per se that was writing. Um, although I, you know, I, I did voice my my suggestions, which uh, kind of a mixed bag. I honestly don't remember what 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 made it um, uh, to, to to the song and what didn't. But when it came time to um, start the pre production rehearsals, and we were working on Last in Line. Um, when I added the keyboard parts to, you know, the intro of, of the title track, as well as the uh, now iconic um, uh, orchestral stabs in the chorus, then it, it was kind of like, whoa, what, what's that? And basically, uh, in the chorus, anyway, I was playing, you know, the, the, the chords that, that Viv was playing, that Viv had written, written or whoever was responsible for the chorus. Mm-hmm. But with, with the keyboards having, I mean, I... I, I might have changed the voicing, and 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 it was the change in voicing that made the that that chorus line da 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 so noticeable. And as a result of having played it that way, then Ronnie started singing some, uh, especially in the tags. You could hear um, uh, hear him doubling that melody line with his voice. So so I, I did have my share of contributions, although on that record uh, they they weren't credited at all, unfortunately. So I have to ask, as a, as a keyboardist for in a metal and rock in the eighties, there was this. You mean like being a brown pair of shoes at a black tie event? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's kind of where I'm going. So there was definitely this um, this tendency, which thankfully didn't last too too long, but where the keyboardists were kind of put off stage. And what was your take on that phenomenon? Well, first of all, what what gives you the impression that it didn't last too too long? Because as far as I know, it's still going on. Oh well, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think I think somebody's got their head up their ass. I just I don't understand that at all. No, I've never really at gotten all. that. Um, yeah, but you know, uh, there's no shame in not understanding. Well, it seems like there was this bi- this big tradition for it in the. So I, all right, so so I suspect I, I think in, in, I, I can only speak about what. Well, I can't only speak about what I know, but I will. I will, for the sake of <laughs> not being criticized later. Um, so, to address my particular situation, um, th- there's no question that that my presence in the band was a thorn in Jimmy's side. Really? I mean, he wanted to be the keyboard player, oh. and clearly, it was decided that for whatever reason, he wasn't going to be. So, he he was gentleman gentleman enough to not be obvious about it, but, but, but the, the displeasure was, was, was almost palpable. Um, uh, I mean, Jimmy and I got to be reasonably good friends, but there was always this thing kind of like underlying of like, you know, well, he kind of took my gig, which uh, to me is absurd because, um, you know, he, he's, he's, an iconic bass player, you know, he, when you hear a Jimmy Bain bass line, you know, it's a Jimmy Bain bass line. And few and far between as they may be, they're still d- definable. Mm-hmm. The perfect example, since we were talking about uh, last in line, the bass line he plays in, in the chorus, I mean, it's, it's exactly the kind of line that Jimmy would play and, and, and has. So, um, I, I never saw where, where he would feel threatened, by not being a keyboard player, because in, in my estimation, you know, he may have played a little keyboard, but he was no way was he a keyboard player. Sorry, that's you know, um, I mean, I, even even keyboard players who I don't hold in high esteem, you know, they they can play scales, they can do, you know, they can play. Mm-hmm. Um, Jimmy Jimmy was just a guy who, in in a, in a almost like a shadow to the flame of Glenn, couldn't really play, but he could make it sound like he knew what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Not to the degree that Glenn did, because Glenn, again, to, to this moment in time, it still astonishes me how well he appeared to play <laughs> for a guy who I couldn't figure out what he was doing. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but you know that that's the that's the beauty of genius. You, you get to get away with shit, right? <laughs> um, but in any, any event, so so I think um, that plus the fact that that deal was clearly an outgrowth of the Sabbath band, mm. and in the Sabbath band, Jeff Nichols was playing off stage. So there wasn't really a strong case to be made. Well, we got to put this guy on stage because he's playing on like four songs that wouldn't be the same without him. Right. That's not, it's, it's not a uh, compelling argument. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got, I got, you know, put at the children's table, so to speak. <laughs> and, um, uh, but, but to, to be fair on that, on that, uh, uh, moment this morning when, 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 you know, I thought this Ronnie call came, um, <laughs> He, he he made sure to specify now, I have to tell you, this is going to be an offstage gig. Um, and I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know what we're going to do at the end of the tour. Mm-hmm. So I, I want you to understand that because I don't want there to be any, any misgivings down the road. And I was like, well, that, that's totally fair. And did I already say yes? Yeah. <laughs> because, again, I, I just couldn't imagine going back to the nightmare that, that the, uh, the project I had been working on kind of had, had mutated into. Um, and again, it had nothing to do with music. And honestly, I'm not sure it had anything to do with with anything personally. Um, but due to mitigating factors and circumstances really beyond everybody's control, it, it just turned into something of a clusterfuck and just that it was kind of done. Sure. Case in point, nobody ever heard from Glenn after the, the uh, youth thrill thing for, for quite some time until they started mm-hmm. doing some other solo work. So, right. um that, that was just destined to, to never go anywhere. So again, um, considering that I was, you know, uh, counting my options on, you know, uh, on, on, on one hand, the fact that, that Ronnie came to my rescue at that moment and happened to offer me that gig was, to, yeah, he could have told me that I have to play on a trap. He's upside down. And I was said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so Claude, going into Ronnie's band, it sounds like you, you knew that you were getting in as, um, um, at least a uh, touring as a keyboard keyboardist off stage. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and as you got more in, involved in the band over the years, did you have any particular feelings about uh, Dio being perceived more as a solo project rather than a band project? Or did you, you kind of um, did that not really have any, uh, did you not hold any feelings about that? Dude, when the band was called Dio, I think that pretty much <laughs> drew the line in the sand. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, there, there, there was, there was a lot of politicking from, from the, 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 the management peanut gallery that, Oh no, we're, we're just going to call it Dio, but it's still a band. Give me a break. <laughs> That's like saying that Ozzy was a band. I mean, really Tom Jones mm-hmm. was a band too, you know, and, and so was Sinatra. No, it was, it was, you know, and, and nor should I mean to be fair, I'm not I'm not sure it should have been a band. Um, I mean, as far as the look, it, it, this is semantics at this point. So it, it really it really is a question of how how do you choose to to perceive well anything. But let, let's let's use a Sinatra example. When you when you went to see Sinatra, you were going to see Frank Sinatra sing. Now it's not like he could sing without a band. There was always a band. But nobody really thought about it. Okay, so in rock, it's slightly different. You know, the, the, we, we have the, the luxury of, of the individual members in the band actually um, developing their own following and, 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 and having, having distinctive roles within the, the social perception, if you will. Um, but uh, uh, by and large, it's, it's pretty much always the singer who you're going to see. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, clearly Zeppelin wouldn't have been the plant band because if anything, it would have been the page band because it was really Jimmy Page's band. But, um, when, when it came to, to, you know, our, our genre of music, you know, white snake is called white snake, but it may as well be called Coverdale. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, again, it's, it's a matter of perception. And, and the truth is that from, I guess, from a, a sales and marketing standpoint, Dio is a pretty good name for, for a band. And just because it happened to be the name that Ronnie adopted for himself, you know, why not? The, the, the reality is without Ronnie, there wouldn't have been any band. So, you know, I, I'm not so sure that there was ever anything wrong with that. You know, I mean, and then, then you kind of have the hybrid crossovers like, you know, Rainbow, which became Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Mm-hmm. Really? <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it, it's just silly. It really comes down to. I mean, there there are so many things about this business which are just ass backwards and stupid. 
Um, for example, case in point, that uh, Black Sabbath had to be called, start calling themselves Heaven and Hell. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. right. And, and I, I mean, do, do you really think that the band you saw when they were called Heaven and Hell wasn't Black Sabbath? <laughs> Give me a break. I mean, it's, 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 some of this stuff just defies credulity. It's, it's why. I mean, there are whys, and more often than not, they have to do with either money or ego. But that notwithstanding, um, to my way of thinking, whether the band was called, you know, Dio or Ronnie Dio's band or, you know, whatever, it, it was it was always about him. You know, he was the boss. He was the, the singer. He was our leader. He was the, I mean, it, it was his thing. So in, in, in to whatever degree we were perceived as a band, I, I just think of that as a bonus. Um, but in, in terms of, um, you know, we are talking about um, obviously being, um, you know, Ronnie being the showcase. Um, I think we can all agree that he had, had one of the most incredible voices in, in rock, if not music. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. So um, through your uh, working with him, um, did you um, see anything like as a musician, like um, what he did to maintain his voice? Uh, was it a natural talent? Did he do any exercises? Not a single um, like, goddamn uh... fucking thing. <laughs> I mean, he would just roll out of bed and sing like that. It was the most damning wow. thing I ever saw. Uh, mind you, same with Glenn. No, mm. did, neither of them guys mm. ever warmed up. Uh, no vocal coach, no nothing. Just, you know, talent. Well, it was crazy. I mean, because I, by that time I'd been around a lot of a, a lot of other singers and a lot of other bands, and you know, uh, um, you know, in, in some cases there were vocal coaches who, who traveled with the band. Um, I mean, not not that I know anything about about the Michael Jackson's touring thing, but I know the vocal coach who was was touring with him uh, back in the day. I named Seth Riggs, and um, you know, he would he would spend hours warming up before you know each and every one of his shows. Um, I mean, not, not not that we want to make comparisons between you know, Michael Jackson's routine and Ronnie's, <laughs> but but I, I yeah. think it's 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 at the very least extraordinarily impressive that it was just there. It was it wasn't you know it, it wasn't something that was coddled. And now to, now on that note, um, he did take care of himself. He was he was uh, very conscious of his of his, his uh, physicality. Um, yeah, he, he wasn't, a, you know, a, a workout demon, but, but, but he, he, you know, he exercised regularly. He, you know, he drank a lot of water. He did all the things that, you know, that you're supposed to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that was more about just maintaining than it was anything else. Mm-hmm. But as far as any special regiment, uh, that, that, that enhanced, uh, um, you know, his natural born insanely great voice. Nope. Not a thing. Not a thing. He did, he did. Um, and, and I, I'm I'm not telling any stories out of school here that um, uh, he attributes a lot of his vocal prowess to the training that he had on trumpet. Mm -hmm. You you guys know that he was a a, kind of a a state champion trumpet player. Yeah. And in the, in James's book, he talked about it and he kind of that breathing, that breathing technique for playing trumpet is what I played trumpet as a kid. I wish that I could translate that into singing like Ronnie. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> not close <laughs> yeah well again you know it, it's the, 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 having I don't think that I think Ronnie was a singer first that he used the trumpet technique to mm-hmm. to to build upon but if, if you don't have the, the, the impulse or the talent or the desire to be a singer in the first place mm-hmm. just being a trumpet player ain't gonna make you one <laughs> no <laughs> I can speak right? for, I can speak to that <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like working with Dio? You talk about like the difference between Dio as your friend and Dio as your boss. Oh yeah. That. So, um, as I said, you know, Ronnie and I got to be, you know, really, really good friends. And, um, you know, I, I loved him dearly. He was, he was just one of the nicest, most generous, most supportive, um, guys that you, you could ever hope to be lucky enough to, to, to think of as a friend. And, you know, I, I had, uh, more stories than you could shake a stick at that'll, you know, that'll bring tears to your eyes of, you know, well, all right. So, uh, as an example, um, uh, my, my mom had gotten very, very ill and I, I had to go come back to New York to, to, to deal with that. And we were, we were in the middle of rehearsals and I was like, well, I, you know, I, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm, I'm an only child. There's nobody else to go. She's all by herself. He goes, no, no, go, go. Of course, just go. Let, you know, let me know what's going on and we'll, we'll figure it out. 
which which is pretty much what you'd expect anybody to say. Nobody's going to say, "The hell with your mom, man! You got rehearsal." <laughs> right, That's right. not going to happen, right? So, so okay, fine. So I go back, and um, uh, she indeed was in bad shape, and she she had been very sick for a very long time. But at, at this particular juncture, um, the, the her 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 doctor had called me that. Um, you know, for a while, she just stopped speaking English and re- had returned to speaking her native French, mm. which was fine because there are a lot of uh, um, uh, Jamaican nurses and so forth, and they can understand her when she's speaking French. But suddenly, she started speaking Hungarian, which mm. is her my grandmother's language. Oh, wow. So they didn't really know why that was going on, and they didn't know what to make of it, but whatever it was, it wasn't good. So, of course, so I get home. And and I, I walked into her. Well, I went to the hospital, and um, I, I walked into her room, and she started talking to me in French. But she was talking to her brother Alex. And she was calling me by you know my, my uncle's name, and I'm like, no, mom, it, it's it's me. And and she um, she 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 was non receptive anyway. So I, I went down to the lobby of the hotel, uh, the hotel, the hospital, um, to call Ronnie just to let him know that whatever's going on, it, it's, it's not minor. Sure. And I called and I told him, you know, that I walked in the room and blah, blah, blah. And the first thing he said was, Oh, oh my God, you want me to come stay with you? Wow. You think you, you take that, take a second for that. to, to take <laughs> in. I'm calling him from 3000 miles away. I mean, yeah, we're close friends and all of this. And he's in rehearsal. They're, you know, they're, they're working on a record and he he doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, or oh, that's too bad. I hope she does 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 better. He just said, do you want me to come stay with you? Wow. Forget the logistics of being three thousand miles away, and you know that that wow. was never going to happen anyway. But the fact that that came out of his lips that instinctively hmm. that told me anything I'd ever have to know about him as a person. I mean that that's you know that that, that was a, a bird's eye view into into the. You know, into his heart, into who he who he was as a, as a as a human being, and I, I mean, I just I, I can't say enough about what that meant to me to have developed a relationship with this guy to the point where he would behave as I would imagine if I had a brother, a brother would. Wow. On the other hand, <laughs> there's the work ethic. Yes. So. Um, you know, Ronnie had to had to walk the the very difficult fine line of of being well. Yeah, and I was the only yes, so I wasn't the only one in uh, in the band with whom he was close. He was equally, if not closer, with with both Vinny and Jimmy because they had played together. You know, in the case of Vinny, he played with with him in Sabbath. With Jimmy, they you know their history went all the way back to Rainbow. So so he everybody had their own little unique connection to him. Um. But nevertheless, when the time came that Ronnie had to be the boss, he had to find a way to navigate that, again, that fine line of being both friend and boss. And, and, and the, the two, the, the two um, roles, more often than not, are, well, maybe not more often than not, but as often than not, are pro- probably mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. Because if, if if you're you know you you, you want to do you know what, what the best you can for your friend, but if you're the boss, you have other other considerations to make, like being able to afford to keep the band going or or whatever else it might be. So so when it came to to business issues, um, he he was he was uh, uh, he was hardcore. I mean he, he he was a good boss. He was a fair boss. You know he he. he I, I don't mean to, to imply anything negative, but but the relationship with him um, in the in the work environment was very very different from the relationship in the in the friend environment, um, and and not not just when it came to like you know fiduciary issues. If 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 we were rehearsing and he wasn't pleased with what somebody was doing, he made no secret about it. One um, one of the people who asked me to elaborate on on the difference between you know Ronnie the friend and Ronnie the, the boss was somebody who prefaced their question with, <clears throat> um, yeah, there are rumors that, that, that Ronnie is uh, an, an absolute tyrant in the studio and uh, that Sabbath nicknames him a little Hitler, <laughs> um, which is, you know, that, that's a hell of a characterization to bestow upon someone. Yeah. But, you know, mm. I, I, I don't think in that regard um, that it's, I mean, it's obviously the reference is negative, but, but what, what people 
would be referring to when they spoke about Ronnie in, in that particular way was the fact that they didn't live up to the same levels of expectations that Ronnie did. Because Ronnie was a well, perfectionist, is too strong of a word, but he, he was very focused, extraordinarily focused on what he wanted. And if he thought that you could do something that he envisioned you doing, whether you thought you could do it or not had zero impact <laughs> on, 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 on his perception of that. <laughs> so if you were struggling to get something right, it, it wasn't because his expectations were too high. It's because you're failing miserably regardless of the reason. <laughs> and and, and that, that was, that was a little difficult to, to, to stomach in some cases, you know, you, 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 you the, the, the impulse is to get defensive and say, well, screw you. You know, if, if, if you think I can do it, you play it <laughs> or, you know, or whatever it might be. But it, it, it was never, it was never sourced from a place of, of, of vitriol or, or yeah, there might've been some anger on occasion, but, it, but it was always in service to the end result. So if Ronnie had a vision of something turning out a, a, a certain way, if, if you weren't accommodating that vision, then you were an asshole. <laughs> I mean, wh whether, whether you were, regardless of the reason, and it, it's hard not to take that personally. And, and, and there, maybe there are, are, are more elegant ways of, of navigating those, those choppy waters. But in the end, his behavior, I, I would say in 100% of the instances, brought out the best of the people with whom he was working, which is what made him an extraordinary producer. Wow. Just, just the fact that he, you know, Absolutely. off the bat, you would know that his expectation, expectations were going to be high. And off the bat, you knew that you're going to have to meet those expectations or suffer the wrath of, you know, someone's dream who you're crushing <laughs> through no fault of your own, I might add. But, you know, he, he inspired the desire to, um, you know, you, you want to please the boss. I mean, that, that's just just normal. Um, and and uh, I don't think there were ever any issues about, hey, man, your ideas suck. It wasn't that. It was never any of that. It was just that, yeah, isn't this good enough? No. <laughs> I mean, not that anybody would say, isn't it good enough? But if you perform to what he per perceived to be less than an acceptable level, and it, this isn't even about chops um, uh, with with, with with me, for example, in one of the things that made the keyboards as um, specific as they were to Dio tracks was was that we we would quite literally exhaust ourselves looking for the right textures and colors to bring different parts out of um, uh, out of the song to life, mm -hmm. and um, Ronnie would kind of expect that I would know exactly what sound he was looking for. And like, so, you know, in, in the earliest days, I would, I would go to the, you know, the standard issue keyboard sounds or, you know, whatever was, was, was hip on that particular week. And, and then, you know, I'd, I'd look at Ronnie's face and know that, no, I'm not even close. And we would end up spending, like I said, hours going through, through different, different possibilities. And it, it genuinely got frustrating. And the, 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 um, the example that comes to, to mind always is, um, uh, in, in the song One Night in the City, in the middle eight, we were looking for something to kind of lift it up a little bit. And we're just going through, you know, this library of sounds, and I'm just scrolling through them and trying them and playing different bits. And, um, and I go, oh, my God, screw that one. And Ronnie goes, oh, no, what, what was that? I'm saying, it's, it's marimba. Let's try it. Like a marimba? <laughs> really? Do you, do you really associate marimba with Dio? <laughs> just play the fucking thing. All right. And I did. And then we processed the sound a little bit, and and that's the um, running arpeggio through the middle eight of one night in the city. The do 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 do. Wow! <laughs> now everybody's gonna have to run out and listen to that. Track. Yeah, that's going to be the first thing yeah. we do after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what if it's on, on the other side of the coin, though, for example, the the, um, the 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 sound in the chorus of Last in Line was all me. I picked that right from day. I'm like, oh yeah, this is gonna work great there, and and everybody agreed. So. That was kind of nice too, especially since it was like really my first first contribution. It's it's always nice if the first time it's bad you get a home run, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. In fact, I think it's on the strength of the sound I used in the chorus of Last in Line that the sound I used on the intro of Last in Line, the you know the the muted French horn parts, um, 
they got a pass where they might not have, have had otherwise. Because it kind of sets up the, the presence of keyboards in the track. And like, yeah, if you like that, wait till you hear the chorus kind of thing. <laughs> no, but, you know, I mean, in, in retrospect, um, there, there are no, no bad memories. I mean, you know, if, 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 he, was, if he was, if he was impatient in the studio or if, if he was a, a, a harsh taskmaster, it was always, as I said, in service to the, to the end result, which is really what you want in an artistic endeavor. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And again, you know, his name was on the records and it it was incumbent upon all of us to create the palette for him with which he could paint exactly what it was he was looking to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you and you all did oh, a yeah. fantastic Absolutely. job with it, or else we wouldn't be talking about it to this day. <laughs> it, it was, it was, yeah. You know, it, it's funny because we, were, I, I, I wasted so much time talking about you know my early experiences in, in those those first bands, but but this was to me anyway it's such a natural outgrowth of the same kind of, of of mentality, where you just really just massage it and massage it and work it and twist it and try it until it turns into what it's supposed to be. And and getting back to your question about from whom I learned what, that was probably not only musically, but just in life, one of the best lessons I learned in that that's all on Ronnie. You know, with, with Glenn, for example, there was, there was never quite that much labor of love because Glenn just, well, for starters, he loves everything he does anyway. So, <laughs> so, so there's that. But uh, in all fairness, everything he does sounds great. And since he loves it all, Oh wow! I just thought of a very annoying political reference there, but I won't go there. Um, <laughs> wow! I'm gonna have to think about that one later because that's this is this is kind of weird now. Um, but anyway, getting back to the different. I mean, Ronnie had a, a, a very specific. I, I think with Ronnie, he didn't know what he wanted the end product to be, mm-hmm. but he knew how he wanted the end product to make him feel when he listened to it. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think, with virtually no exception, he, he achieved that. Um, yeah, I mean that that Ronnie was look. Ronnie was a very, very smart and very, very complicated guy. And um, you know, like 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 most people, inherent in that are are infinite numbers of, of contradictions. So I, I think the, the higher the bar becomes, the more challenging it is to to um, achieve. Um, whatever is being sought out by the person in that position. But uh, again, it, it's one of the, uh, one of my, 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 I don't know, I don't want to say proudest accomplishments. That, that's really not what I'm trying to say, but uh, one of my most um, cherished memories of having had the opportunity to, to work with Ronnie and to have been inspired to, become the player that I needed to be for him to be happy with me. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess to answer that initial question, I probably learned most from Ronnie. All right. <laughs> there you go. None, none of my taken too long to get to the answer, but okay. Well, we're, we're glad we did. Uh, but as we um, as we get ready to wrap up, I just wanted to ask you one th- one thing. So, the rumor has it that you are actually an answer in the Trivial Pursuit game. Oh dear, that's so. Right. So what was so what was the question? <laughs> what could the question possibly be? Who was the handsomest guy in? No, that wasn't it. <laughs> um, uh, it was. Uh, oh, let's see if I can try to remember now. It was who? Um, who has the distinction of having played with both members of Deep Purple and Rainbow? Okay. I think that's or how it, it was it worded. Black Sabbath? Oh, I'm maybe? sorry. No, 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 no. My bad, my bad. With, with um, uh, uh, Deep Purple and Sabbath. But, yeah, who, who had a distinction of playing with members of both Deep Purple and Black Sabbath? But yet was never in either band. Exactly, yes. So. That's right. So that's very. Wow, it, did, did you did, oh, did wow. you find the card? Yeah. By <laughs> I don't have the card, unfortunately. Because I know I know I have it somewhere. Some, somebody brought it to me at, at, at a gig, and I was like, "Trivial Pursuit? What kind of yuppie bullshit game is this?" And and it was like, <laughs> "Holy crap! I don't let Vinny see this, or I'll never hear the end of it." <laughs> well, I, I just think that's incredible <laughs> because you know, just thinking back, I'm like, "Wow, that seems like it's impossible," but 
because there's so yeah, much no, overlap and inter intermingling and then be, but that's an incredible distinction is the word you're looking for yeah. yes yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, just look in, in, in rock bands in general. There, there are incestuous relationships like that. But, but between Purple uh, uh, Sabbath, well, it, it all kind of uh, hinges on Ronnie, anyway, doesn't it? Sure, yeah. because those are the bands that Ronnie was in. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So what? So before we uh, close out here, what what are you up to now musically? What sort of thing? What sort of projects are you working on currently? What are you excited about? So I do drywall now. No, not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've I've been doing um, well, you know, gotta make those ends. So I've been doing a lot of different things. Um, I, I was teaching for a while at the Musicians Institute, and uh, I've been doing a bunch of soundtrack work. Um, I actually had a uh, um, an opportunity to do a, a, a soundtrack for what was going to be a Pixar feature. Unfortunately, the writer director passed away, and now the movies are going to get made. Oh no! Which is unfortunate because it was kind of a cool deal. Um, actually, did, did you have a chance to visit my website at all? Um, yes, I did. So the the, the mm -hmm. opening, the piano music that you heard on the on the opening page, that yep. was one of the one of the themes for this for this Pixar film. Oh wow! But anyway, yeah. So so you know, it depends on on who's hiring. But uh, I'm keeping busy. I've been working on a, on a solo project for a while. But um, to, to tie in with the discussions about Glenn and, and Ronnie, um, because I don't sing myself, I mean, other than, you know, a half a dozen reasonably useful baritone notes, which are more about harmony than anything else, um, the melodies that, that I was writing were melodies that I couldn't sing, mm. because like I said, I, I can't really sing. But the melodies that I was hearing in my head were, were, were melodies that I imagined being sang by someone of Ronnie or Glenn's caliber. Mm. So when it came time to find a singer to actually sing them, yeah, surprise, there aren't, you know, there aren't a lot of guys who can <laughs> sing like that. I mean, I found guys who could sing quasi like Ronnie in, in, in Ronnie's range, but they didn't have the, you know, the stratospheric notes that, that Glenn would have. Mm -hmm. And then I found guys who were like legit rock screamers, but they didn't have any real usable melodies uh, in between. So after, after years mm -hmm. of working on this, I finally found a guy um, through an incredible vocal coach um, who, who had the chops, who learned the songs, he had a great ear, and um, we were pressed this of um, getting signed by Capitol Records a few years ago, and on the day the lawyers were brought in to start hammering out the details, he decided that it was not something he really wanted to pursue after all. Oh, no. Which, mm -hmm. yeah, that collective sigh you hear is like so many years of my life is going away um, so ever since that happened I mean it, honestly it, it did take a couple of months to recover from that mm. because that was a seriously devastating blow to have worked that hard to be that fortunate enough to get in that position only to have it evaporate for no legitimate reason mm. um, and as it happens the guy moved out of town and, and I think he's a photographer now or something but I mean he doesn't even sing anymore and I don't mind telling you he was quite a, quite a capable singer but in any event so since then i've been um, struggling to find a guy um who can uh, uh pick up the baton and, and uh hopefully get me back to being able to shop a deal with the, the material that i've been working on for quite some time now um i mean it's, it's it's a tall order because you don't really see many singers of, of the ilk that you know that um that we grew up on guys like gillen and you know glenn and ronnie and uh rob halford and you know the list just goes on and on um, mm -hmm. but I'm, you know, I'm certainly not going to stop looking, so we'll see where it takes us. That's great. Well, we wish you all the best of luck with that. And, um, I appreciate that. Super thrilled that you were able to come on the show and talk to us about Ronnie and your great career. And it's been a real pleasure. Oh, it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure, guys. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, um, hopefully we'll, uh, when you, when you find that magical singer, we'll have you back on to talk about that project. <laughs> that sounds like a plan. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be great. All right, well, thank you so much, Chloe. Yeah, for, 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 in, in more ways than, than, than you think, but yes. <laughs> um, anyway, you guys, it, it, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I might add that it's, it, you know, it, it, it does my heart good to know that um, uh, that, that the, the music of Deep Purple is still being, you know, talked about, and, and, and it's out there for, for people to uh, um, have you as a resource to get excited about. Oh well, thank you. Yeah, well, it's our it's our pleasure to talk about yeah, all thanks. of your music. It's it's fantastic. So much so much to dive cool. into every every week. Awesome. All right. Well, thank awesome. thank you, Claude. All right. Yeah, it was a lot Wish of fun talking to you. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. 
Yes, you too. Thanks. Great. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. And that was our interview with Claude Schnell. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed all of our Ronnie James Zio coverage this week on this sad anniversary of 10 years since his passing. But as you can see from all of these great conversations, his legacy is living on and his music is stronger than ever. So thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to the Deep Purple Podcast. If you like what you hear and would like more episodes in the future, please donate on Patreon to support the show. You can also give us a rating on iTunes to help new people discover the show. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for show updates. See deeppurplepodcast.com for more details. Thank you for listening. I've got John on the line with us. John who? John. Hey, John. Hey, John. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Claude. Nice to meet you. And you. So, John, just before we get started, why does your name sound ridiculously familiar to me? Um, and I'm not just talking about the John part. <laughs> <laughs>